Well, good morning, Trees Forever audience. We're so glad that you could join us today. My name is Jackie Wedeking, and I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager here at Trees Forever. I'm here with Carrie Sorrell and Leslie Burkus. We're going to get started very shortly at 10 o'clock promptly, but I want to give you a chance to do a quick audio check because a lot of times we have some audio issues. So. Um, in the meantime, we're going to do a little bit of a casual conversation just to give you a chance to mess with your speakers, make sure that you can hear okay. Um, but our actual program will start at 10 a.m. So while we are, while you are checking your audio, I want to introduce our presenters for today. Um, we have Carrie Sorrell. Um, Carrie, tell us a little bit about what you do at Trees Forever. Sure, hi everyone. Um, I am Trees Forever's Des Moines Program Coordinator which means I work in Des Moines and I run um, our Growing Futures program and our Tree Keepers program. Um, I manage all of our planting activities in Des Moines um, and yeah, I get to hang out with lovely volunteers. It's great. Okay, let's see. And, and we also have Leslie Burkus yeah. on the line. So Leslie, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Leslie Burkus. I am Director of Programs at Trees Forever and I have worked at the organization for nine years, live in Des Moines, and so work with Des Moines and the metro area, helping support Carrie with all the work she's doing, and then help Trees Forever oversee all of our programs that cover the entire state of Iowa and also into Illinois. So really happy to be with you guys today and talking a little bit more about how we can still keep on with our plantings in this new world we're all living in. Yes, so it's very neat to be here today with you guys because usually we are not all in the same office. So, I mean, that's one good thing about being virtual is that um, I am here in Marion and Carrie and Leslie are both in Des Moines. Um, Carrie's working specifically with Growing Futures. Carrie, do you want to tell us a little bit about what the goal of Growing Futures is? Yeah, sure. So for those who don't know, Growing Futures is a teen workforce development program that we have in both Des Moines and Cedar Rapids. I manage the Des Moines program and we hire teenagers from all across the city to plant trees in the spring and the fall and then to take care of trees in the summer, watering, mulching, weeding, um, sometimes some pruning. And last year was our first year of the program. It was a really exciting year. We were able to employ almost 40 young adults um, throughout the two programs and take care of almost 6,000 trees, which um, was awesome. It was a really great success year. Um, and the, the point of the program really is to um, is to plant more trees throughout the city. Obviously, that's a, one of our goals, um, but also to address some of uh, the tree inequity we see. So really getting trees into uh, the parts of the city that don't have a lot of tree cover or canopy. Um, and also to build up the next generation of tree lovers and potentially arborists to show these teenagers um, a path into arbor work and, and tree work. So yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah. And um, Leslie, Growing Futures was kind of your brainchild. Do you want to tell us where that idea came from? Yeah, um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I've been working for Trees for, for a little over nine years in the entire time in Des Moines. And we've been working a long time with the city here, working with volunteers to plant trees. And it was really wonderful to work with so many people to get trees in the ground. But I realized pretty quickly driving around and looking at those trees we just planted that some of them were suffering uh, from lack of water. And so we'd spent so much time getting those in the ground that I didn't wanna see all of our hard work, all of our volunteers hard work for not. And we, so I said, we have to do something to make sure these trees are cared for. And so we looked at models across the country and said, hey, this is really innovative to employ teenagers to water and care for trees. We get our work done. It's really important to us to get trees cared for and watered. And so they live to be 40 years old or hopefully much longer than that. But we also get to employ teenagers and um, just help raise them up, build the next generation of our community members who may be our next leaders in our community, too. So it's really a win win for all of us. Wonderful. Well, it is coming up on 10 o'clock and we want to get our program started. It looks like I'm not hearing about any audio issues, so I think we can carry on. Um, just a reminder to our audience that there is a questions tab on the right hand side. And if you have any questions for our panelists, please go ahead and enter your questions there. We will answer those at the end. 
Um, and I am really just here for technical support. So if you are having any problems, go ahead and email me or send a note in the questions and I will try and help you troubleshoot. So I will let Carrie and Leslie take it away. All right, I'm gonna hide our cameras quick as we go through this. And let's start right on in. So yeah, thanks for joining us today. Um, the topic today is trees naturally social distance and so can you talking about how we can still get trees in the ground and hold planting events during uh, the time of COVID-19, this kind of wild, wild world. So like I said, I'm Carrie Sorrell. I'm the Des Moines Program Coordinator and I manage all of our tree planting in the city of Des Moines. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Trees Forever or maybe you're just vaguely familiar, um, our mission is to plant and care for trees and the environment by empowering people, building community and promoting stewardship. Uh, we do that in a variety of ways, but mostly through community tree plantings. And um, we, in the 30 years of our existence, we've planted more than 3.4 million trees in both Iowa and Illinois. We're a nonprofit organization and doing a lot of work and we're based out of Marion, Iowa, but we have staff all across the state and uh, two staff in Illinois as well. So a little bit about trees forever. Um, for those of you who didn't hear earlier, um, a little bit about our work in Des Moines. Um, we have two programs that we rely on for a lot of our tree planting activities um, and tree care activities. The first one is Growing Futures, which is our teen workforce development program. Teens across the city help plant and take care of trees throughout the year, as well as get professional development experiences like green job shadowing, financial literacy classes, those sorts of things. Um, our other big program in Des Moines is our Tree Keeper program, which is a three-part class that trains residents in proper tree care, um, tree planting, and tree identification um, so that they can become robust volunteers and tree keepers throughout the city. Um, they're a really amazing force that helps us uh, with our activities and helps keep a watchful eyes on the trees. Um, and we've been doing that for quite a few years. And uh, those tree keepers really are the backbone of our volunteer force here in Des Moines. And between these two programs, Growing Futures and Tree Keepers, um, that's most of our capacity for tree planting activities uh, in the city. And um, with these two groups, uh, last year in 2019 alone, we were able to plant over 700 trees in Des Moines. Um, and it's it's just really exciting that Growing Futures program is brand new and tree keepers um, have been around for a while. So to see them combine and um, with that great success last year, it was just really fun. So um, like I said, those two groups help us do most of our plantings on a normal year. Um, and this is anything but a normal year and it's why we're here. Um, so things have looked a little different recently because of the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic. And because of that, um, because of a lot of new safety guidelines and just a lot of new restrictions on how you know, we can interact and how we can work, um, we spent a lot of time rethinking how we can do plantings in a safe and responsible ways. Um, and that's what we're here to share with you today. Uh, we're gonna share our ideas and our experiences because we have tested some of these things out. Um, and in this presentation, we're just gonna cover some questions that you should ask uh, yourself before planting happens. I'm sure you've been asking a lot of questions like, how can we do this? How can we get this done? Um, but just some ones that help us clarify how we can plant. Um, we're gonna go through a few planting scenarios that you can implement. Um, and then we're gonna go through our best practices and tips based on what we've seen and done over the last couple of months. So um, these are general thoughts and ideas, and hopefully they'll apply to you. If you have any questions about how a strategy might work for you, um, your town, your group specifically, feel free to th throw them in the question uh, area, and we'll talk about them at the end of the presentation. So um, we'll get started. So uh, the questions that we suggest you ask first, these are questions uh, we recommend that you think through before planning or hosting an event. And this first one is, um, is kind of a big one. Can our tree planting event be postponed to a later time? Um, can you wait a growing season or two? If your planting isn't of immediate priority, consider this option. 
Um, there's still a lot we don't know about the virus and giving yourselves more time to make decisions and to gather data and to understand what's happening um, will always be safer. Um, if you're dealing with a grant situation, um, you know, you can talk to your grant provider and see if your grant can be extended. Um, maybe some of the plantings that you were hoping to accomplish this spring can be accomplished this fall, um, or just depending on what happens with the virus, maybe it can be pushed to next year. Uh, that's what we've kind of done. We've evaluated kind of our priority areas and figured out um, what, what plantings can be pushed off just to ensure that we can do them safely um, and in the right way. So the next question, um, how important is it to have a community building event for your planting? Um, could the planting be done instead by a smaller group or just by your planting committee or uh, by city staff? At Trees Forever, we always encourage involving the public in planting activities to build community support. Um, we love to have people out at our plantings and we think it's it's such a important and visible way to demonstrate the value of trees in any area. Uh, but during this time, that might not be safe or possible. And that's okay, you know, it's, it's an unprecedented time. We're dealing with things that we've never dealt with before. So um, if, if it can't happen, you know, it's okay. It's sad, but it's okay. Um, you know, could you rely on the capacity instead of your planning committee or your small group um, or work with the city or town staff to complete the planting instead of having volunteers? Um, sometimes it's impossible, or sometimes it's possible to involve others, to involve volunteers. And we'll touch on more on that later, but, um, this is really one where you know you have to ask yourself is it is a priority uh, planting the trees or is the priority involving the community and if the priority is involving the community maybe go back to that first question and say uh, can it be postponed so. and then the third question that we ask ourselves and that we've been asking a lot is if we have a planting event are we able to maintain social distancing requirements mask wearing and proper cleaning protocols um, spend some time thinking through this if you can ensure the safety um, of those that would be involved with the planting. Are you able to space trees and planting locations out? Um, are they able to do the work while having a mask on? Do you have access to cleaning supplies? All of these things. Um, the good news, like we said, is that trees are always distance apart in socially distanced recommendation. Um, so there are ways to make this work. Um, but really think through the safety aspect on the people side of this. Uh, if you're not able to ensure those things, or if you're not confident that you can enforce some of those safety measures, um, you know, it's maybe time to, to look at a different option. So speaking of the different options of plantings, um, we're going to go through a couple of different scenarios that you could, that you could do during this time um, to to still get trees in the ground. And we're gonna talk about three different options and what all goes into them. And those options are based on a spectrum that we've been thinking about that's um, the tightest guidelines and the most restrictions to kind of the loosest guidelines and restrictions. And those restrictions are based on federal and state recommendations, but also uh, your individual city and municipality areas. So definitely make sure to touch base with any leadership in your area to figure out what they're comfortable with if you are planning on partnering with the city um, or planting on city ground. So we're going to go through these um, through the tightest to the loosest and talk about what that might look like. So the first option with the most restrictions is a small group planting. And when we say small group, we think we're thinking people already involved in the project. Um, like your planning committee, or maybe asking some city staff to assist. Obviously, that means less tree planting capacity. Um, so in this first bullet point, try to determine which planting areas are the highest priority and focus on those. Um, because you have less capacity, you're going to be able to get less trees in the ground with this option. So really focusing on where needs trees the most or what area is most important to your group or to the city. Next thing to consider is uh, post-planting tree care to ensure the highest survivability chances. 
Um, so make sure you're setting your trees up for success uh, during the planting since they're likely to get a little less attention this year than maybe they normally would. Um, give them plenty of water when you're planting, give them some trunk protection, and give them a good layer of mulch to help them retain water throughout the year. Um, if the tree doesn't have a good root base or if things are looking a little shaky, just err on the side of staking those trees um, since we don't really know what uh, our capacity for tree care down the line is going to look like this year. And another thing to keep in mind is to make a watering plan. Um, these trees, because they might be, be getting less attention, um, are going to need some water, going to need a little love. So decide how your trees will be watered throughout the year, uh, whether it's a local volunteer, whether it's your planning committee, um, or you alone, or if city staff again can be involved in that. All right. The next option that we have is resident plantings. Um, and this is along that, that spectrum. So we're moving more towards looser guidelines um, and a little more flexibility in the work we're able to do. Um, you can offer tree planting as a fun kind of stay at home activity um, or social distance activity to residents um, that they can do in their, what we call their isolation unit, which sounds really official, but really just means uh, the people that they've been social distancing with. So um, their families or their partners or their roommates. Uh, in this scenario, uh, residents can sign up to plant a tree in front of the yard in the city right of way, or if your program allows them to plant in their in their private space um, in you know in their yard, and um, it allows them to plant trees on their own, um, and with as many as will fit in front of their yard. Um, the planning committee to determine how many trees people can plant should conduct a site analysis uh, beforehand and and mark exactly how many trees and where those trees should go in the yard. Here at Trees Forever, we, or at least in Des Moines, we, um, we take white marking paint, we get from the hardware store, and we draw a big circle where people should, where people should dig, and then we put a little tree flag in there um, to mark exactly where it should go, just to leave no confusion. Um, and then after you've determined how many trees uh, they can plant and how many trees they want to plant, uh, the committee or the city can deliver all the materials like the tree, a bucket of mulch, uh, the trunk protection, like a tree guard, um, those sorts of things to the resident. Um, always double check too that the resident has the proper tools they'll need and access to water for their planting. Um, but this is just kind of a fun way for people to still get outside to chill, to still help you in planting trees, but to you know maintain a safe distance and um, to kind of make it as low impact as possible and low interaction as possible. The next thing is to do planting education before planting day. So uh, make sure folks know how to plant trees before dropping off their materials. You can make a basic how-to video um, or instruction sheet that people can watch ahead of time and reference while they're planting. Um, just to make sure that people know the proper technique in which in the way that you want them to plant trees um, and yeah they feel empowered and educated to do that on their own um, and then after they planted their trees it's important that someone come around to check that the tree was planted properly so uh, that can be someone on your committee it could be a local volunteer who knows a lot about tree planting and knows how to spot planting issues um, and the resident should know how to take care of the tree into the future. So that's weekly waterings and regular weeding and mulching. All right. And then our final option along that spectrum, this is the one with kind of the loosest guidelines or restrictions, is what we call a social distancing planting. So these are open to a larger community, um, the larger community and the residents. Um, and they're typically in they're typically kind of a, a more traditional planting event so not scattered like the resident plantings would be but they are centered in one location like a specific park or uh or along a specific street and they'll typically require um you know they won't be just a couple of trees they'll they'll require some some volunteer capacity to get the planting done um, and these events can still be safe um, and following, and we've got some strategies coming up to ensure that. So um, first and foremost, 
though volunteers should know that they'll only be planting by themselves or with their isolation unit um, and not with any other volunteers. That's been really important to us and to communicate to our volunteers that we want to limit interactions between um, people who haven't been social distancing together as much as possible. So that's really the backbone of this strategy. Um, from there, it's um, it's kind of smart to rethink some of these plantings. Maybe um, these plantings might need to be instead of you know two or three hours for an event, they might have to be multi-day or you know just a one-day long um, event. And um, we've developed a system where people can sign up for a series of staggered shifts. Um, to ensure that there is plenty of time and space between volunteers arriving and going and planting. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how Trace River is doing that soon. And this is just kind of a teaser of a form that we'll go through a little bit later. Um, but the staggered shifts and the different planting locations are kind of essential to the social distancing planting. And um, to, it's, it's always good um, to, reduce the potential germ spread. Um, you can ask your volunteers to bring their own tools to the planting. Um, if they need to borrow your tools, if they don't have the right equipment or the right tools, um, you and you have tools available, it's totally fine to let them borrow them, but please make sure that uh, you sanitize them before and after they use them. Um, here in Des Moines, we've been using just a simple bleach solution and spraying down all the tools and wiping them. Um, and then again, um, you know, with this option as well, you want to make sure that volunteers know how to plant, um, how to plant that tree before they arrive. Uh, usually for our planting events, we'll do a, a live demonstration, um, but people like to stand pretty close for those and they want to kind of crowd in and see exactly what you're doing, which is good. Um, but for this purpose and in this time, that's not good. So um, doing all of the pre-education that you can beforehand um, and then answering questions on site is kind of how we've been approaching this. Okay, so um, those are kind of the three options that, that we've been thinking through and we've um, provided here. And now I'm gonna show you a little bit of how Trees Forever has handled the pre-logistics of our social distancing plantings because these do require a little more organization and a little more thought through. So um, the next slides are screenshots of a form that we put together for our volunteers to fill out if they wanted to plant with us. I will say we are using tree, keep, uh, tree keeper capacity or groups that have planted with us in the past right now. So this form might be easier for them to understand than a new volunteer who hasn't interacted with us before. Um, we are lucky in Des Moines that we have a lot of volunteer capacity that's worked with us in the past, but you might not be in that situation. So um, for your purposes, if you want to use a version of this form or modify it, um, you might need to expand it um, if you decide to use something like this and do a little more explanation. So this is these are screenshots, like I said, of the form that we've been using. Um, this is what we've been sending out to volunteers to um, gauge their interest and to have them sign up. So just kind of some simple information at first, their name, their email addresses, and their cell phone in case you need to get a hold of them um, day of or something like that. Um, and then this question four on the left here um, asks how many additional planters they'll have with them um, if they are planning on bringing family members or their roommates or their spouse. Um, it's always good to know how many people are planning to be there. And then over here um, on the right, we asked them to estimate how many trees their planting group could or would like to plant during their shift, during a three hour shift specifically, we've been doing three hour shifts. Um, we don't want people to shoot for the stars and say that they can plant 12 trees in three hours when they really can't. This is really just an option to gauge how many trees they would like to plant or what their capacity might be. Um, so this kind of helps us determine where we place them for locations and um, how many people we'll have at, during a specific shift. And then below that, we have a question asking them um, what tools they have and what tools they might need to borrow. So um, that's always good to know too. It helps you plan 
for the day of, of how much you need to bring and um, and what sort of sanitation needs you'll you'll have. And then on this last slide here, this is where we ask people um, their availability. So um, for this specific planting, we we thought that it would it could probably be accomplished in one day, but just in case um, people were hesitant to come out or they weren't available on weekdays, we gave them options for two days. And then you can see our shifts in here. We have a nine to 12 shift, a one to four shift, and a five to eight shift. And that allows for enough time for people to plant, but then also there's an hour buffer between all of those shifts for us to be able to either take a break or sanitize tools or get ready for the next shift um, and allows ensures that there's no crossover between people who are coming and going, um, really just reducing potential for interaction as much as possible. So that is the form that we've used um, and it went pretty well. We were able to accomplish that planting in one day. It's been nice. Um, and then what I do from here is um, I take that the information that people give the estimated trees that they could plant and then their shift availability and I kind of put them into a spreadsheet. And from there I develop um, I develop a map um, here that you can see. It kind of helped me visualize the planting a little more and assign tree locations. So you can see that this is, uh, this was our planting location. All of these little tree icons were new trees that we were going to be planting. Um, these blue icons were just existing infrastructure that we would want to avoid. And then you can see here that trees are kind of bundled into these purple planting locations. And on the side here, you can see that those have been assigned to people. So um, this is just a custom Google map. You can make one at My Maps. Um, and it really helped us um, it helped us visualize where people would go, how we could space people out. For example, for an eight o'clock shift, we had a group here, we had a group here, and then we had a group kind of down all the way over here um, and really helped us visualize. We also sent this map to the volunteers after they signed up to show them their specific locations so um, that when they showed up to the planting, they could just go straight to their location and um, didn't have to check in with us if they didn't want to. So. Um, this has been really handy and um, and a really good tool for both internal uses and communicating to our volunteers. It also really helps for tree delivery if you have um, if you have to set up a tree delivery for your nursery. So yeah, yeah. So that kind of uh, covers our main options for safe tree planting during this time. Um, of course, you can mix and match those different options, the social distancing, the resident planting, and the small group options, just based on what works best for you. Um, and now we're going to cover some of our some of our best practice recommendations based on safety guidelines and our own experience. So um, best practices. Uh, encourage anyone who has been sick or who has had symptoms in the last two to three weeks to stay home. Um, the same applies to people who have knowingly been in contact with a sick person. Um, it's, you know, it's just a best practice everywhere right now. Um, and a lot of the messaging that we've been receiving. And um, discourage handshaking or high fives. Obviously, that's kind of standard right now. Um, you know, we love to give a good high five after a tree goes in the ground. It just helps celebrate it. But right now, unfortunately, we've got to discourage that obviously if people are working with their families and they've been um, you know in isolation together they can celebrate and that's fine um, but this is this is for you know organizers to to kind of avoid that with volunteers um, and with people that you haven't been distancing with and the next one is encourage the use of face masks um, this is something that um, is definitely a best practice, but um, as we found out, kind of hard to act upon. Um, it's, it's as you might imagine, kind of hard to do physical labor with a face mask in front of your face, especially as the weather gets hotter and steamier and becomes that beautiful, humid Iowa summer that we love. Um, face masks can can kind of get in the way, and in that case, we've 
We've encouraged people to wear face masks when they're talking to others, when they are around others that, um, that they haven't been isolating with and when they're interacting with us. But um, when they disperse to their own planting locations with the people that they've been distancing with, we've thought, um, you know, if, if they can't do that work, if it's uncomfortable in that instance, it's fine. Um, but again, something to think about, you know, if they're going to be in a public park and there's going to be other people around who are not a part of the planting and you can't control that, it's always best to encourage the use of face masks uh, whenever possible. Next one is to provide um, either a hand washing option or station or hand sanitizer for your volunteers and also to um, to encourage them to wear gloves whenever they're, um, you know, working with tools or working around other people. These are just kind of some of those basic safety recommendations that we've been seeing throughout right now. All right, and uh, the last one here is to ensure social distancing for everyone. Like we said, trees are naturally distanced, so they're in a safe location, um, either 20 or 30 feet apart. Um, but um, we like to go a little bit further and uh, divide people out uh, based on the planting area. So like I said, we, we give people plenty, plenty of space to work on their own. You can see in a picture here of a planting that we did last week um, that there are three trees between Andre in the front here and then um, David and his friend in the back. So there's plenty of room. Um, they're still planting at the same time. They're still planting at the same location, but there's plenty of space between them. And there was a lot of waving. It was kind of nice to see everyone out there, um, but they are at a safe distance. So, and here are those again, just kind of a rundown. All right. Um, now, all of that was kind of serious and important info um, for how we handle this uncertain and, and sometimes scary time. How can we still plant uh, during these times? Um, but now I'm gonna hand things off. Uh, I'm gonna hand the reins to Leslie and she's gonna talk about how we can still make these plantings and these events uh, fun even during this weird time. So Leslie, take it away. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, just to kind of wrap up what Carrie's been mentioning here, make sure you look over in the handout section. We have typed up all of this information. There's a PDF that you can download and save that runs down everything that Carrie just mentioned. And as we talked, it's a, it's um, a lot for all of us to deal with right now. We are with you in knowing that this is a strange time and we're all doing the best we can. And the nice thing about trying to figure out these tree plantings and providing you this information about how you can keep moving forward is that trees are just such a great way to build community. And we know what it used to look like to plant trees with a lot of volunteers. We have people together. You see this picture where there's people standing side by side, jumping in the air. We can't do that now, but we can still get people out and we can still make it fun. So I'm gonna run through a few things. Carrie can take me to the next slide. And right off the bat, you're like, oh my gosh, Leslie, what are you showing me this picture for? People are right next to each other. Well, we're gonna have to get new pictures here for the next few months, but this is one where we, uh, every time we do a tree planting, when we finish up, everyone does the tree wave together. So they put their arms in the air and they wave their arms back and forth like they're tree branches. So I wanted to show you what that could look like, but I have a little arrow here where, how about we could still do this and people could be six feet apart doing their tree wave together. Um, just imagine that map that Carrie showed you and you've got people in um, staggered areas across um, a street or across a park and just tell them ahead of time, hey, we're gonna do the tree wave. And when I yell that out, everyone's gonna stop and throw their hands in the air and wave together. Or maybe you have a tree chant that you could make up that um, everyone kind of yells at each other or you've got kind of a, um, a hype person who might go out and help make, keep everyone excited during the tree planting event. These are some simple things that could happen. I bet you have someone in your town or your community who's just that like great person to hype everybody up. Have them come out and help and that, that could be a really great role for them. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth between some things that could happen day of event and just some ideas that could highlight trees throughout the year. If you joined me for my webinar last week, you've probably heard some of these things, but if you weren't there, I wanted to highlight them again. So 
in this kind of context, I want to start talking about things that you could do throughout the year that might not be planting related, but still let people know that your town loves trees. So this is one where during the Des Moines Marathon, we plant 26.2 trees along the 26.2 mile marathon course. And if you're wondering, 0.2 trees are just two little trees, two seedlings that we get from the State Forest Nursery. So live during race day, we are planting trees along the race course. And it's such a wonderful way to add shade, maybe you know, a little oxygen for these runners, sunscreen for these runners, um, and a great way to raise the profile of trees. Um, I've also mentioned that the city of Marshalltown and the Marshalltown Trees Forever Committee has put a parade float in their community's uh, parade every year. So they're showing that their committee is active in the community and they highlight trees that way. Do you have something in town that is like kind of a key event to your community that you could have a fun, innovative way to still do tree plantings and highlight trees within your community? Next slide, Carrie. Okay, another uh, thing that we do, and I also mentioned this, is our Tour to Trees. So Tour to Trees is a bike ride that we do and we have tree stops along the entire course. Um, so we had five curated tree stops. We had people sign up for to ride their bikes and they got to ride around and they got to stop at different sites. Here we have people explaining some really huge cottonwoods in the city of Des Moines. And they, the riders stopped, got to hear more about why cottonwoods are so important to our ecosystem, how long those cottonwoods had been within the city and how they are actually some of the largest trees within the city of Des Moines city limits. So many towns in Iowa and I know across the country have bike trails and it's a really great way to get people out, especially during this time. So maybe instead of having people stand around, could you create a map and have people just go about it on their own time? You could create a map, have a few custom tree stops on your tree route within your town, along your bike trail, share that map in your city newspaper, on social media, have them as handouts somewhere. And people could say, hey, my family needs to go out on a bike ride this weekend. We've been kind of isolated for too long. We have gotta get out in nature. And they could do this on their own time. And you get to raise your profile of your tree group or your city and the work you're doing to, to um, plant more trees, plus highlight how important trees are to your community. Another great thing to do is the big tree event. So in a lot of towns, there's just gigantic trees and so many people are out walking now. They're probably noticing their favorite tree. They're probably pointing and saying, oh my gosh, look at that tree. It's one of the biggest I've ever seen. So this would be a great, really great way for you to have a contest with your city or your tree committee or maybe your beautification committee in town and say, hey, we want you guys to nominate the big trees in our town. Send them in through social media or mail them in to us and we will gather them all and we'll award the big tree. On the right, me standing next to one of the state champion cottonwood trees. And so I could submit this tree to my city and say, hey, I've got, this, I've got the champion tree here, I wanna win. And it could be a wonderful way to engage more people. On the left is another um, tactic Trees Forever has done is taking price tags and putting them around trees and saying, hey, this tree provides us a lot of benefits. And here it actually pays us $81,000 in benefits over its lifetime. And if you're wondering how we calculate that, all of it is calculated through iTree. And so you can take, go into iTree, it's iTree.org. You put in what kind of tree species you have, how big it is around, and iTree will spit out these numbers to you and it'll say, hey, this tree is awesome. It takes up this much stormwater, it takes up this much, or it covers and creates this much energy efficiency. And all of that adds up to real dollars and here's how much it is. If you have questions, you can definitely follow up with me or Carrie and we can get you more information on how you do tree benefit calculations. Okay, another thing that we've tried before is tying things to trees. And this is, we, was our Would You Be My Valentine event where we put little, um, we had about six different things to highlight about trees. This one says trees are excellent urban homes for birds, bees, and squirrels. This tree lovingly cared for by tree keeper volunteers. We had our website and then a hashtag that people could use. 
And with this one being on Valentine's Day, around that time frame, we actually tied them all around trees in key restaurant locations, since we knew couples would want to be going out to have dinner together for Valentine's Day. And we could then have them get out and see these, take a picture of themselves and use the hashtag to highlight tree love within their community. We've also tried it during an art festival where we said uh, nature's work of art and the same type of little sayings that we had on each one and tied them to the trees in the art festival location so people who were out and about could see this. So this could just be your two and a few around your town. Could you think of something to tie to a holiday or just a general thing to um, highlight trees? And very important message right at the top there, do not leave things tied to trees long-term. I know someone on this call is probably saying, oh no, those, the, the, if someone leaves that on there, it could be really bad for the tree because a tree's anatomy means that it starts growing out and it can incorporate anything that's tied to it. So this is just a short-term thing. We put these up for a week, a way to highlight the trees and we had volunteers come back around and take them all off the trees at a later date. So just something to keep in mind and make sure you're not leaving things tied to trees long-term. And of course, social media. I just mentioned using that hashtag uh, with the tree valentines. Is you're doing these social distancing plantings and people are on their own social, our own distancing unit planting their trees. A way to keep is to have them use social media to take a picture, take a selfie of themselves planting the tree, and then tag it. So they, if you create one for your own community, all you have to do is you can make any hashtag you want. So it could be your name of your town plants trees, hashtag Marshalltown plants trees. And everybody uses that hashtag and you tell them to do that. And then they'll go out and take their picture on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Snapchat, they post it, use the hashtag, and everyone can then connect that way. So on the right here, we have somebody, we were, we were encouraging people to t hug a tree and send us a picture. And so this woman did that and sent it to us. On the left is um, a gentleman that we work with quite often to plant trees, and his son was planting his first tree with him. That's little baby Wesley, who planted his first tree and you can see Shane used all sorts of hashtags on Instagram when he posted this. And most recently, Trees Forever has developed a Facebook frame. We have a picture of that coming up. So you can go onto Facebook. If you click update my profile picture and you start typing in Trees Forever, you can find this frame. It's called, and you could have people use this themselves. And it says, I plant a better tomorrow by planting trees, of course, and it's got the Trees Forever logo on there. So if you're out planting a tree or you're doing this through your social distancing work together, this is another option to highlight that and get more people excited about planting trees and sharing it through social media. So that's just a few things to make sure that we're keeping our plantings fun. This is this is great. We want people to get out planting trees. And so many months and weeks of us being distanced and isolated, we can do this safely and we can keep it fun. And so I hope this helped um, give you a spark a few ideas and we're ready to take some questions. So I think Jackie is probably gonna come back on and help yeah uh, okay let's go ahead and see everyone's screen before we do questions um do you want to do a quick thank you to our partners and kind of say what we have coming up because before we anyone leaves i know people all have busy schedules right now i want to make sure that they kind of recognize that all of this is possible thanks to our trees forever members our partners and our sponsors so if you are a donor we really appreciate it i want to take a moment just to say thank you because um, we're able to provide these free webinars because of great donors like you so let, carrie there's actually one more slide if you could advance there you go um so if you are not a donor we would we would love a donation um the link is is bit.ly um, bit.ly um, backslash give TF. So um, again, thank you very much for your support. Um, and then I also want to let you know that we have a webinar coming up on June 11th. 
It is with That Tree's Mark Hirsch. If you have not heard Mark Hirsch's story, I really hope that you can make it to this webinar. Um, it's a very inspirational story about this bur oak um, in rural Wisconsin. And it, he's an amazing storyteller, and I really think that you'll enjoy it. You'll leave inspired, I'm sure of it. So um, the registration link is right there. Uh, so going back to questions, of course, to keep us on task, um, Leslie and Carrie, we did have a question about quality control. Um, you have the training video and you have laid out lots of nice tips on how you can do this, but it's, I mean, there is a different dynamic where you can't go up to someone right as they're doing it and say, oh, that's, that's too deep. You're planting that tree too deep. How do you make sure that there's good quality control? whether you're doing a volunteer planting or whether you're doing, say, a tree distribution where you're not right there. Definitely. Um, that's something where we, we encourage people to um, have volunteers or a committee set up to go through and either day of after the shifts or the next day, um, go around and check all of the trees that were planted either by residents or volunteers um, just to ensure that um, they were planted collect correctly and that everything is um, secured and everything is done in the way that you want them to. Um, and if it was planted incorrectly, if it was planted too deep, too high, um, if there isn't tree protection, if it needs to be staked or um, the mulch is too close to the tree trunk, you can go through um, and it's not too late to correct those things. So it might take a little more work, um, but definitely having um, a crew or just a volunteer go through and check all of those is um, right after the fact is important. So. And I'll add, um, there's a little risk. You're going to have to accept a little risk with this, and that is okay. We're going to assume that some that the majority of our trees are being planted correctly. If you provide a video ahead of time, um, and there's a lot of different handouts that you can find if you go to U.S. Forest Service or TreesAreGood.org. There's lots of different opportunities to find handouts for proper tree planting. And Trees Forever is going to also be creating another handout as well that has more visual representation that will be on our website in the next couple of weeks that you could share with people. So one, I think, accept a little risk, provide as much education as you can ahead of time. And as Carrie said, have somebody go around and do some quality control checks afterwards as well. Great. And um, as far as resources, we do have a few resources on our website as well. And so if you look in the questions tab, there's someone who asked that question earlier. So I just shared those links on there. So um, the, our website also has some of those links as well. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about you guys talking about the volunteer component. I mean, you have the question at the beginning where you say, should this be a volunteer event? Is that the most important part? Like, well, I mean, as Trees Forever, that's a big part of our philosophy. We think that it's so important to have volunteers out there and getting their hands dirty. And so I don't want to underrate the importance of that in this conversation, too, because it's not as simple as just, hey, let's just get the trees in the ground. Like, we want to make sure that we don't lose that ownership of the trees as well. Leslie, do you want to start off on that? Sure. Yeah. You're right. That Trees Forever's mission is all about planting trees, but we always do it with people. And so this is different for us, too. It doesn't look like it did before. And it's been a, a challenge and it's been heartbreaking sometimes to say, well, we can't get out and plant with people as much as we could before. And I think just accepting that and knowing it's going to look different this year is fine. We can we could still make this work. And if it if you can't get out and plant with a whole bunch of people, that that's OK, I, I think especially this year. But with that said, do know that this is why we went through this and uh, talked about how you can still get people out and do it safely. We listed all those questions to ask and then just being really thoughtful and creative ahead of time with coming up with these ideas of how you could split people up into distance units, keep them separated along a city street or in a park this is going to work. We did our first planting last week and we had no problems keeping people distanced. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, having the mask with us at all times was a really great um, tactic to take. I would say you should almost make that a requirement for your volunteers, have your mask with you. And 
just pop it on and off. If you're getting close to people, it needs to go on. You should still keep six foot distance, but if you're getting to be closer to people, have a mask on. When you get to your planting site, take it off. That, that's okay. Um, and that's also why we go through those things at the end of the presentation that might not be planting day of. If you can't keep up with your volunteer plantings, that why, that's why we talk about fun things you can do, the big tree event, tying things to trees. That, that also raises the profile and keeps people endeared to trees in your community. Great. Um, Carrie, do you have anything to add on add to that before we move on to the next question? No, I think that those recommendations that Leslie gave at the end um, are, are really, yeah, they're really great ways to build community in a time when it's sometimes it's just not possible for us to be in the same space um, or people don't feel comfortable being in those spaces. So. Absolutely. Um, so we do have a question um, specifically about growing futures. Um, and I'm going to preface this with um, growing futures doesn't look like um, how we would ideally want it. And I'm going to let Leslie expand on that a lot more. The question specifically is, earlier I believe Leslie mentioned that a high school volunteer program who water and care for the trees. What are the log logistics of that? And do they drive around in a watering tank and do young trees get the maintenance too? Yeah, I'm gonna actually kick it over to Carrie since she's the one on the ground managing all the time. So Carrie, maybe you could tell us what it looked like in a normal year and just kind of highlight a little bit of what we're going to have to do this year. Yeah, so in a normal year, usually we have um, a 15 passenger van and a big trailer attached to the back that holds all of our tool, tools and a 500 gallon watering tank. Um, we have a lot of sites throughout the city that we visit on a weekly basis, um, close to 20. So we're shuttling those teenagers between those work sites um, and watering, pruning, mulching, those sorts of things. Um, and those are almost exclusively focused on young new trees. Um, and the trees specifically that we're planting and getting in the ground. Um, every tree that we plant in our partnership with the city of Des Moines comes with a two-year maintenance contract. So for two years, we are watering those trees um, every week and doing all of the maintenance on those. So mulching, all that kind of stuff. Um, this year, obviously it looks different. Um, we did have to cancel our spring season of growing futures, unfortunately. Um, we miss the teenagers, I never thought I'd say that. Um, <laughs> But um, we did have to cancel this for safety. And we've been thinking through um, really thoroughly what our summer is going to look like as well. Um, we are not confident that um, those safety guidelines can be followed um, in the way with the equipment and the way that we work. So we postponed our summer uh, season until July 1st this year to give us a little more time to evaluate the trend of the virus in Polk County and in Iowa. Um, and just a little more time to gather information that can inform best decisions. Um, it may be that we're able to um, pick up operations again on a smaller, uh, limited basis with less teenagers and um, more vans so that people aren't sitting around each other in a big van, sweating, breathing, all those kinds of things. Um, and yeah, and smaller crews. Um, it may also be that we'll just have to cancel the summer season, which would be really sad and unfortunate, but um, unprecedented times. So um, we're, we're making adjustments to that program as well, as well as to our tree keeper program, um, going virtual as much as possible and keeping safety in mind as much as possible. And I'll add to that, um just a little bit more about logistics and then if you're in a town what well, i've seen some other communities do too so uh, with tree keep or sorry with growing futures we pay our teenagers they're paid ten dollars an hour there's two adult crew leaders who are paid fifteen dollars an hour so they're being paid for the valuable work that they're giving to us and we want to give back to them because of that so um, if you're thinking about this for your community do know that they are getting paid and that, that they need to be so um, think about how you could make that work in your community and then our teens are also engaged weekly in professional development. So we want them to be ready for future careers, maybe with us someday, maybe with you guys, wherever you guys are located. So they get uh, professional development that focuses on developing them for future jobs. So it might be resume building, financial literacy training, things that develop self, so stress management. Also financial literacy helps you develop yourself too. 
and then uh, green job shadowing. So it's a really robust program that covers lots of things, gets the work done, but gives back to those teenagers too. And I will mention this could be a great thing for you guys to try as a more um, isolated thing as well. I, there was a town in Northeast Iowa that every summer they hired a teenager to prune their trees, their young trees throughout the community. So it takes a lot of training, so you'd want to make sure that you had someone who trained them on proper pruning. And I don't think this would be leaving the ground. It's the only thing they could reach from the feet on the ground. But this could be done in a single person, single teenager going out caring for trees. It's always hard to keep on top of tree pruning, so maybe that's the thing you could hire a teenager to do. Um, the watering, if you guys had a city vehicle you were willing to have one teenager drive around with, or uh, maybe two if they're wearing a mask together, they could get out and do watering throughout your community. So those could be things that you practice as well. If you have, I mean, here we're water, trying to water 6,000 plus trees a year, so we have we need lots of capacity but you might not have as much that you're trying to get taken care of, but could still use the help. Yes, and if you are um, if you are interested in kind of that layout that Leslie just mentioned of having a teenager trained, I mean, we do have webinars that are coming up that you could um, utilize to help train that person. You're, you're not alone in that either. Um, our next question is, can you describe the tool sanitizing process in more detail, please? Are you going to offer gloves for volunteers to borrow or require everyone to bring their own equipment? So we ask that volunteers bring as much equipment as possible, their own gloves, um, their own tools. Um, but we do have all tools on hand that, um, that they're free to use. And our sanitation process is um, we use a bleach solution that we spray on over the whole tool, um, contact points and wherever they may have touched it. You know, sometimes you lay a tool on the ground and you lean on it and, um, and that's just um, something to watch. And so we, we use a bleach solution, we spray it on there, we wipe it all down um, and we let it sit for a little bit in between shifts. And as much as possible, we um, we don't use the same tool with the same volunteer. So um, we have a lot of shovels, obviously. Um, so we like to rotate through those and, um, and give those shovels time to breathe for at least three days um, or in between planting events. So. Um, and I, I was handing out tools and I had gloves on. So I put gloves on immediately as I was handing out tools to people as they came back. I still had gloves on and I was spraying it down with the bleach and then hanging them up. So um, the, it, if you're keeping an eye on it, that could be another job that you assign to one person. So there's just one person in charge of that. That might be a good option to um, put into place. You know, you've seen that already at grocery stores. There's one person in charge of cleaning down the handles on the grocery carts. Could be a good thing to engage somebody. Um, and then we, we're pretty fortunate, I'd say, Carrie. We had, most people were able to bring their own tools. They had their own shovels, most people do. Um, and then a garden fork, something that you're removing soil at the top of the root ball to find root flare. A lot of people have that. And then we also like to use serrated um, knives to cut the roots on each side. I was surprised quite a few people had that as well, but you could also use a box cutter or some other knife to cut roots as well. So just providing some different options and letting people know the different types of things they could be and what it will be used for will help them think, oh, hey, I've got that one tool in my garage that would be perfect for cutting roots on the side of the root ball. Just being really as specific as possible. Okay. Um, our next question is from Michael. He's wondering, how do you handle volunteer check-in slash waivers for the three types of tree plantings? That's a good question. Um, Leslie, do you want to talk about that? Well, uh, the, vol the volunteer sign up and waiver. Okay, so Carrie showed you the form. We used a, it's a Microsoft form, which you could use a SurveyMonkey or a Google form to create and people signed up that way. Uh, that is, I think, really important step to take for any contact tracing that might need to happen as well. So knowing where people were and who was joining you for your planting event is really important. So it was all done electronically beforehand. We knew all the volunteers coming, so we didn't need to sign them in as they were getting there, but that is something you would need to think about if you don't if you're opening up to a broader community. So I would say you get people to sign up beforehand, you have your list printed off. Could be another one where you might want to assign that to a single person or have somebody who's got multiple jobs, that's one of their jobs. 
as people come up that you might be putting your mask on right away. So you're standing distance and you're saying, oh, what's your name? I'll check Carrie Sorrell off, she's here. And then directing them, pointing to what location they need to get to. Plus you provided them the map ahead of time so you should know when they're getting there and what site they're going to be at um, the day of the event. Uh, waivers, we would probably cover that with our simple waiver we have already with volunteer plantings that people know the risk that they're coming to as they're coming to an event, so we handle it that way. Your city might have a waiver that they require, um, and if you have more questions, we can help you out with that too. I will say that there are um, electronic services that let people sign those sorts of forms um, electronically with an e-sign. Um, I don't have a specific website, but if you go online to an e-sign form, um, search that, there should be options that let yeah. people, while they're signing up for shifts, um, you could just include a link to to sign that and have it directly forwarded That's to you as point. well. All right. Um, we also have a question about um, about Earth Day. Um, this year was the 50th anniversary, and um, David is asking, how are we celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day? Yeah. Um, I will start by saying it's been kind of emotional because we had some really <laughs> cool things planned, and um, some of this is just wait and see. Um, some of it we hope to do in the fall. Um, Leslie, can you provide some more insight? <laughs> I'll do my best. I mean, it's the same thing. We're all trying to figure it out together. I think you've heard this before, so I know it's totally cliche, but every day is Earth Day. <laughs> so that's how we're going to view it. And we're going to look at as as things trend this summer and into fall, we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, typically, we have an entire week of events called Earth Week Blitz that we hold in Cedar Rapids area. And then we have plantings around the entire state and into Illinois, or the other state we work in. Usually if you try and call one of us during Earth Day or Arbor Day, <laughs> it's hard to get a hold of us because we are everywhere during those couple days. So it definitely was different, but we are really confident that we could hold something else later this year. I haven't heard if there's anything national. I know the National Earth Day was trying to do a virtual event, which just isn't quite the same, I know, but best we can do. And I'm not sure if they're looking at a different date this year to do an Earth Day event. If anyone knows, we'd love to hear it too in the questions. So I'd say if you want to do it for your community, do it. Declare Earth Day. Um, use one of these planting events and say, hey, this is belated Earth Day event. And again, every day is Earth Day. Okay. Um, I also think it would be great if we touched on how some of these tips could be used for a tree distribution sale. We have a lot of tree committees that we work with and volunteers that are working with residents who plant the trees. And I mean, some of those resources, some of this advice could be used in that sense too. It just looks slightly different. So say the um, there's still the video resource that we shared. Um, what else would you guys recommend? Yeah. Um so a couple of our key volunteer groups I know have already done distributions events in Prairie City and then um, Council Bluffs, uh, Trees Forever all did their distribution events. And planning ahead, communication ahead of time, all really critical to it. So I'll go through a few things I know they did and then some ideas I have to make a good distribution event. So what, if you're not familiar with that, these communities either they, they buy the trees and then offset it to make it um, a lower cost option to get trees on private property. So the city might have a budget line item where they're purchasing trees or the local group gets a grant and they buy the trees. And they might buy them for $100, 80 to 100, and they sell it to the resident for $30. So it's um, you're sharing in some of the cost and you get more trees planted that way. Then the resident needs to come pick up their tree and they need to plant it. So what's it look like from there? I'd say some of the things we talked about here, you might go alphabetical. It, um, letters A, last letters A through L can come at this time. Um, I'm going to lose track of my alphabet. M through whatever next letter comes at this time. And then the rest of the alphabet comes at this time. So you're splitting up the number of people. You should know who signed up ahead of time and how many people you're going to have in each of those shifts. Just like at the grocery store, you can mark out locations where they have to stand six feet apart. Um, if they need to get out of their vehicle, um, I think that'd be the safest way and what we've seen those other groups do. I know Council of Bluffs was doing the curbside. Think about what restaurants are doing. In um, Council of Bluffs, the person didn't get out of the car, everyone had masks on, and they were just putting the tree 
either in the trunk for them or set it by the car and the person got out and put it in their car however they wanted to do it. Um, maybe you could also do a drop off. Again, think about what restaurants are doing where they're doing delivery to people. Could you, if you don't have that many trees you're distributing, could you deliver it to people's homes um, and have a couple of volunteers get out, drop it off the person's house with a bag of mulch and say, here's your planting instructions, plant your tree. Um, I'd say those are the things we've seen so far. And then everything we talked about, you, you know the safety protocols already. If people are sick, you're telling them to stay home. You're asking them to wear a mask. You're asking, you're having hand sanitizer at every event. Just those basic things need to be there. And then trying some of those creative ways as well to do delivery, drop off, um, curbside delivery, or having people come in staggered shifts. Great. Well, I think that we can start to wrap it up here. Um, I think it'd be wonderful to hear just a one minute, if a one minute takeaway. So Leslie and Carrie, if you, if people only get just one thing out of your talk today, what are, what do you hope will be their takeaway? Um, yeah, I think the takeaway is to think um, thoroughly through your different events or your different options um, and figure out what is best for your town and your committee and um, keep in mind all of those safety recommendations and how you can build an event um, or an activity around those um, while still including people um, if it's safe. Yeah. I'm going to do two, Jackie. <laughs> I would say over communicate. So over communicate ahead of time. You will not I don't think it's possible to give too much communication to people. So tell them exactly what you're planning so they know what to expect. Think about what you've seen from people who are doing really good jobs communicating on how they're handling COVID and model it. So if you're seeing people um, laying out, here's what we're going to do, here's what we expect of you, and here's how you'll handle the day of event. People know what to expect and they will be much more comfortable coming out to your event. And then the last thing is I'll just reiterate, what I ended with on my part of the presentation is this is fun. You can still do a planting event and you can do the tree cheer, the tree wave and keep it fun day of. If you can't do something day of or you're not doing your events, what could you do this summer to say, hey, send us your big tree picture, use the hashtag and show us your favorite walking route. So people are still connected to you. They're still connected to trees. We can do this and we'll, we'll still endear people to the environment and trees. It's all about creativity. Yes, absolutely. And you guys have done a really good job at outlining that. Thank you. Um, I do want to remind everyone one more time, there is a handout that lays out all the stuff that we just talked about. There's also resources on our website, um, treesforever.org forward slash tree underscore selection has a good checklist. Um, you are welcome to use any of those materials. And, and we hope you do. That's why we created them. Yeah. So. We hope to see you at one of our webinars this summer. The next one is June 11th. And thanks so much for joining us. Yes. Bye. Thank thanks. you. Bye.